This is Solve It for Kids. Hello, my amazing and curious friends. My name is Jennifer, and this is Solve It for Kids, the podcast that gives kids and families a peek inside the real world of scientists, engineers, and experts as they solve problems in their jobs using creativity, cooperation, and critical thinking. And now please welcome to the show my podcast partner, Galactic Space Geek, Jeff Ganya. Hello, Jennifer, and hello, listeners. I am super excited about today's episode because I get to learn some stuff. I know it's going to happen because today we have a guest that's going to talk about a topic I don't know that much about. Wow, this is really cool. What problem are we solving today? How can you become a code breaker? How can you be a code breaker? Ooh, I want to learn about this too, Jeff. Who is our guest today? I know, right, Jen? Today we have the wonderful Lori Walmark with us. And listen to this. She is a computer scientist former computer science professor, and now a multi-award winning children's author. This is awesome. Welcome to the show, Lori. I am so excited to be here on Solve It for Kids. (laughs) And we are excited to have you. Just so you all know, Lori and I are very good friends, and so I've been waiting for her to be on our show. I'm so excited because we're going to talk about code breaking and also making your own codes, right, Lori? Absolutely. So let's start off with what is a computer scientist? Like, what do you do? Okay, a computer scientist, there are many things we do, but one of the things we do is translate English into something that computers can understand. In other words, we are coding English for computers. Okay. So that leads me to ask my first question. Why can't computers just understand English (laughs) or whatever language the computer came from? Whichever country. Oh, that's a great question. We'll go back to Admiral Grace Hopper, who was the first person who thought that same question of why do we have to use ones and zeros and zeros and ones with computers, the language they understand, instead of just saying multiply or divide. So she was the first person to actually do that. And from there, we've gotten as far as, hey, Siri, hey, Alexa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've come a long way. So so when did Admiral Hopper do this? It's not like ancient, ancient history, right? No, we're talking maybe the 50s. Oh, wow. Right. So yeah. it really is not long ago because she was working during World War II. And then after the war ended, so maybe late 40s, early 50s, she developed a program. And that program eventually led to a computer program called COBOL, which was used in businesses around the world. That was the program that people used. And it all started from a program she had written. Oh, that's cool. I think so. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. How did you get to thinking that was cool? How were you exposed to computers that led you down this path? Okay, that is a good question. Because when I was a kid, it's not like we had computers in our pocket or on our (laughs) desks. One summer, summer after 10th grade, I was fortunate enough to go to a program sponsored by the National Science Foundation. And we went to a computer campus and it was a math program and I took three classes and one of them was programming and I was just blown away this was so cool okay give this information to a computer and get information back but then I came home and of course still no computers (laughs) right (laughs) (laughs) yes but I went to college and lo and behold Colleges had computers. Yeah. They didn't have a computer science department yet. That was, you know, 
too far oh, wow. in the distance. I was yeah. like maybe 10 years in the distance. Okay. But I could take courses in the electrical engineering department. And it's just fun. So when I graduated, I love science. I love math. I love science. Yay! Yay. <laughs> and when I graduated, here was this dilemma. Do I get a, a job with math or science? Or do I get a job with computers? Mm. It, it, it really was nagging at me. Mm. Then I found out there was something called a scientific computer. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Custom you made just exactly. for you. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> You're using computers to solve scientific problems. And I was home. That was it. I loved it. Okay. I want to ask, do you remember the first scientific problem you worked on on a computer? I worked for a pharmaceutical company okay. and we were working on programs to test and see if drugs were safe and effective. Oh. So that is the first thing I worked on was these sort of programs that took in all this data from the people in the drug trials and figured it out. Right. Because if they wouldn't have okay. had computers, you would have that would have been done manually. Right. Exactly. Like you, you have Whoa. to like make all these big gigantic spreadsheets, which I know you love spreadsheets, but still I do love spreadsheets. That would be yeah. a lot of work. So okay, so can you talk to me? Did you still have to like key in all of that information? How did how does that work? I didn't. Oh <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Listeners, we are all laughing because of the face Miss Lori just made. <laughs> When she was so happy saying that she didn't have to do that. <laughs> exactly. But someone had to do it. And someone was taking okay. all this information from all these drug trials and manually typing it in okay. to a program that had been set up to accept the data. And then we used that data to figure out if the drug was safe. So did you write the program too? Or someone else wrote the program? No, I wrote programs. Oh, okay. Okay. Wow. And I even wrote one, we called it a general program. So it wasn't specific to a specific drug trial. You know, you could take data from this one and data from that one. Right. Okay. Try and figure out what's going on. Yeah. Computers kind of open up the whole world for comparing things and, and whatever, right? Much more exactly. quickly than having all of these people do it manually. Right. You know, you still need the people brain, obviously. Yes. You need someone to look at the information that's coming out. Computers help you organize it. Oh. And I have a degree in information systems. And that's really what that degree is, is it's putting together data, and people and processes in okay. order to get useful information. Okay. Sounds good to me. <laughs> so when you finished college, what type of job did you start out with? Okay, so I was a scientific programmer at a pharmaceutical company. And I okay. did that for about five years. And then I switched to a consulting company. And I moved up the ranks and I became a project manager, a senior project manager, vice president, you know, as one does. But I still loved you know, sticking my hand in there and programming. Yeah. So even though I wasn't nice. programming myself anymore, I still was helping. <laughs> oh, yeah. OK, so let's take it further. So we're talking about code breaking and making codes. So what does that entail? Is that something that, you know, even someone like me who doesn't know a lot about coding could do? Absolutely, because codes are all around us. If you're driving down the highway and you see a sign for your favorite fast food franchise, mm -hmm. that, that is a code. That is telling you that, that they're going to sell you burgers or whatever. Oh. You know, so codes are really, we don't even think about it. Reading is a code. We have letters on a piece of paper, right. A P P L E, and we know that that means apple. So it's a code. Right. I never thought of it that way, but that's cool. Exactly. So once we have codes all around us, 
if we want to send a coded message to a friend, we can't just write it in what's called plain text. Right. Um, Dear friend, I am writing you this secret <laughs> message. <laughs> <laughs> be surprised <laughs> right that doesn't work that well <laughs> so there are many things you can do obviously you can seal the envelope and make sure the eavesdropper doesn't right. find the message right but chances are the person will right, right. and code breaking you talk about alice and bob right so alice and bob are writing each other messages and eve is the eavesdropper who wants to break Uh that message so what can alice and bob do they can make a code they can figure it out between them use the same code so let's say i'm alice i write my letter but i don't just write it in plain text i use a code that we've agreed upon okay So when Bob gets my letter, he knows the code we've agreed upon and he can decode it. Oh, that sounds fun. But Jeff, we should totally do that. (laughs) I definitely think so. It's going to take a little brain power on our side. But yeah, yeah. well, yeah. (laughs) I have had people send me coded messages on social media because... Do they? Okay. Do you know the code, or are you just guessing? No, because there are <laughs> ways. If it's a simple code, the simplest code is called a Caesar cipher. Okay. And all that is is you're just shifting the letters over. So oh. instead of you know you have A B C D, right? You shift over, and in the coded message, you put an A instead of a D, and a B instead of an E. You're just shifting over by three. It's called a Caesar cipher. So it's the simplest one to code. It's the simplest one to decode. It's also the simplest one to crack. (laughs) Well, yeah. Because (laughs) in English, there are certain letters that are used more commonly than other ones. So I've, I've written Bob a long letter. The most common letter in that letter is going to be E. Right. So I can look through and see, ah, these are probably E's. And then there's, you know, different sources give different things of what what the next common letter is. But most people say it's the letter T as in Tom. Okay. Okay. So we've done our, what probably is E. Let's put in what's probably T. So now you may be able to see words like the. the. If you got yeah, sure. T blank just... E, chances are it's the. So now you have figured out the letter H and you continue on from there. So... And Mr. Sajak, I am ready to solve the puzzle. <laughs> <laughs> I... Nice Wheel of Fortune reference there. <laughs> exactly. So Eve, if she gets our message, still might be able to solve it. Mm, Okay. All right. So we might want to use more complicated coding systems, but maybe Eve is not that good at codes and a simple Caesar cipher will do. (laughs) So while you were both learning this really cool way of changing the world as computers were being written and you were writing programs for this stuff and then you started doing it in the world, were codes themselves sort of like these ciphers? Were these a hobby of yours outside of work as well, outside of the computer? Not a lot. I love math puzzles, and often math oh, puzzles okay. are codes. So, <laughs> okay, you know, you'll have a string of letters. These letters plus these letters equal these letters. So what do the letters mean? Gotcha. But I thought of it as a math puzzle, not a code puzzle, because I love math. Right. Because who doesn't love math? (laughs) Not me. We all love math. Everybody on this call loves math. (laughs) (laughs) So that leads into the next question. So if kids want to become computer scientists or computer engineers, and there's, there's so many different data analysts, all of these jobs now, do they need to love math or at least understand math really well? 
Okay, so I'm not actually currently a computer science professor. I was one. And while I was one, students would come up and ask, hey, computers seem to be a great field to be in. You can make money. You can get jobs. And the first question I would ask them is, do you like math? (laughs) You don't have to have gone far in math. You don't need highfalutin math. But you have to have that math mindset of thinking through problems. And if you don't have that, you're not going to be good at programming computers. And you're not going to be that good at cracking secret codes either. Mm. Because you just, it's a mindset. Sure. Makes sense. And it sounds like a mindset that you have had right from the start when you got a chance to go to that computer camp. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I love math. I always assumed growing up I was going to be a mathematician. Ah, okay. Then I went to college and I thought, but they have all these science courses. (laughs) I can take all these science courses too. So I majored in biochemistry because that's the one that enabled me to take the most varied science courses. Yeah, not chemistry major. Nope. That was. Oh, set okay. for you. So I want to, and you just mentioned it for me. So thank you for that great transition, mentioning being back in college to take those courses. I do want to mention you did attend Princeton. Yes. And we are talking about a time when computers and this whole idea of coding. And like you said, we didn't have, you didn't have a computer at home. They were not nearly as prevalent out in the world as a female student. Were you vastly in the minority? Were you the only one? Were you kind of looked at? We see this in the movies. It gets talked a lot more about now. But this is really early on in computers. Can you kind of share your experience there? Right. Well, majoring in science to begin with Mm -hmm. made me in a minority. When I went to Princeton, it was only the third class of women who had gone all the way through to completion. Wow. Right. So it was very early on. So I was already in a minority. Finding a ladies room was often a problem (laughs) because they just had not thought things through. I I can relate to that. Yes. Right. So you're in a minority. Now you're in the sciences. You're in more of a minority. Yeah. So there were definitely classes where I was the only woman in the class. And one memorable one was being taught by someone I had dated when he was a grad student. (laughs) And now I was the only woman in the class. And he had thought I was so brilliant. I mean, I was just so brilliant. And now I'm in his class. (laughs) Yeah. That's great. You can't skip class if you're the only woman, especially if you had once dated the Right. person who was now the instructor. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't know about the dating thing, but I was in the, what, 10th class or whatever at the Naval Academy. So I can relate to um, being a female in the science majors. There were two of us right. out of 30. And so, yeah, it was a minority back then. But now, you know, talk about how important it is. We're seeing a lot more girls get into coding and talk about how important that is. Um, yes. Today. But, and I should have had these figures with me, but I don't. The number of women entering computer fields has gone down from when I graduated. And that was back in 1976. Wow. So it has gone down. And is there a reason that they know for that? Yes. The reason is personal computers came out. They had games and all the games were aimed at boys. So Uh, boys were playing computers. uh, They were getting used to computers while girls weren't. So you get to college and boys had all this computer experience and girls had none. That makes total sense. I remember my brothers playing computer games and me being like, like, I don't don't get the allure (laughs) of this. I still don't. You know, I never thought about it that way, though. That's that's right. Interesting. Wow. Yeah. So there are. Definitely places that are turning it around. One of the places, Harvey Mudd College, 
has more women in their computer science major. It's an engineering school now Mm -hmm. than men, slightly more. Oh, way to go. But it's due to the president of the college. Maria Klawa made it her business to encourage and to give away for people maybe who didn't have as much experience as some of the others to get into the field and not feel like, I can't do this. I'm, I'm so far behind. There's no way I can catch up. So I'm going to use that as a segue into talk to us about your books, because this is a great way. Your books are amazing and they're a great way to get kids, both girls and boys, interested in coding at a young age. So tell us a little bit about the books that you write. Well, first of all, thank you for saying both girls and boys. Yes. Because both girls and boys grow up to work together, and they both need to know that women can be scientists. So I started with books about computer people because, you know, that's what I am. (laughs) (laughs) You write what you know. (laughs) Uh, So the first one, Ada Byron Lovelace and the Thinking Machine, she was the world's first computer programmer. Wow. And this was back in the 1800s. It was amazing. A mechanical computer, it was never built, but she wrote the program for it. Wow. So back then, it is amazing. Many years later, like 10 or 20 years ago, scientists built the machine that it would have run on, Charles Babbage's machine, ran her program, and there was like one tiny mistake. And that was Wow, that's pretty impressive. That's very cool. Yeah. Okay, and then I've already mentioned Grace Hopper, Queen of Computer Code. And the big thing she did, in addition to that idea that why should we have to talk like computers, you know, let computers understand our talk, right? Is she popularized the idea of writing software? So it wasn't just engineers anymore, it wasn't just mathematicians, you know, and of course, now kids write programs, everyone can write programs. But that was her big contribution. Next, I did Hedy Lamarr's Double Life. And this is actually related to computers also. She was a beautiful, glamorous movie star. Yes. And she co-invented the technology that keeps our Wi-Fi safe from hacking. Oh, wow. That's impressive. Yes. No idea. Yes. Neither did anyone else. (laughs) (laughs) Because it was, again, during World War II. She gave, she and her co-inventor gave the patent to the Navy to use as an anti-submarine, to be able to, not anti-submarine, to be able to send missiles to submarines without the enemy intercepting where they're going. Gave the patent to the Navy. Navy decided they just didn't have the money or resources right then to implement it. So there it sat. Classified top secret, of course, yes. and, sat and sat and sat until eventually it was no longer top secret and someone found out about it. That's cool. Put it to use. Yeah. You know, so my first three really were computer. Okay. After so- that, I, I started to change direction. And I thought, well, I love science. I can write about other scientists. There are other scientists. Sure. I love math. Math is my first (laughs) love. Why can't I write about a mathematician? Even though many of these women I've already written about were mathematicians, but that's not what they're known for. Sure. So who did you pick? A mathematician. I chose Sophie Kovalevsky and her big achievement was describing the rotation of solid bodies. Like planets and satellites or footballs and tops. No one had been able to do that before. Plus, it's something kids could understand. Right. Because that's the big problem writing about mathematicians is so much of it is abstract to bring it to a level that kids can understand it. So that was that one. And then we're up to code breaking. Right. which (laughs) Which is... What we're talking about, Codebreaker Spy Hunter, how Elizabeth Friedman changed the course of two world wars. Yeah. She was not a mathematician. She was not a scientist. 
She was an English major. Really? I didn't know that. Yes. And she was hired by an unusual person. <laughs> Let's what? just leave it at that to prove that Shakespeare did not write Shakespeare's books, that they were written by Francis Bacon. Huh. And that involved a lot of pattern recognition and looking through right. and, and comparing things. And she soon realized that Shakespeare wrote the books. <laughs> <laughs> it got her interested in coding. So she and her soon-to-be husband would write coded messages to each other. World War I happened, and they needed a code-breaking unit. The Army, and they did it at the location. It was called Riverbank. And Elizabeth Friedman and her husband were going to head up the code breaking unit. Wow. No one, that's no one cool. knew anything about codes. Might as well choose people who like to play with codes. <laughs> <laughs> it, it really came down to that. And I just find it amazing when I look at yeah. some of the codes she eventually broke with rum runners and then in World War II. It's like, how did she do that? How did she look at this and somehow figure out? Yeah. Because codes can also be, you know, like the sign for the hamburger place. She broke a code of the famous doll lady. Oh. And the doll lady would write letters. Yes, I'm sending you the doll with the fisherman with the bag over his back and the doll with the this and the doll with the that. And she managed to figure out that this woman was writing about battleships and the location of where they were. Oh, wow. Those, that's like secret information at the very right. least. <laughs> right. So you know, the woman's name was Velvely Dickinson. Love that oh my name. Gosh. Right. So Velvely was writing, you know, she owned a doll shop. So she was writing what seemed like reasonable letters sure. to wow. people. Yet, Elizabeth Friedman somehow was able to figure it out. It, it just, it blows that's, my mind. That's a true code breaker, right, Jeff? Yes. Like if you can figure out stuff like that, that would be pretty amazing. Yes. Right. That would be fascinating. Exactly. You know, just, it, it's amazing to me, you know, more than the math. I can understand people doing it with math and statistics and computers yeah. and all that, but these insights into codes are the ones that are just, you know, mind blowing. Yeah. And I'm not her. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we were just talking about your code breaking book and that has been the topic of our conversation. And we could talk to you and talk to you and talk to you because we know you have other books and they are fascinating topics as is how you talk about and the passion you have for math computers and coding all but yes. this and is the point making sure women get their due yes another passion of mine very much so this is the point in our show where we like to ask our guests if they brought a challenge for our listeners and i am waiting with bated <laughs> breath because i think i know what you're gonna say okay so i mentioned earlier about the caesar cipher and the challenge is going to be how you can make your own Caesar cipher Ooh. so that you can write secret messages to a friend. Okay. Is this different than the way you already described one? It's more how to do it. Okay. You know, sort of step by step. And the step by step is you write out all the letters of the alphabet, right? A to mm -hmm. Z. Sure. Okay. And then underneath, you choose, I'd use a different color pencil maybe, so you okay. don't get them confused. Underneath, you choose a different place to start with your A. So you don't put an uh, A under an A. That doesn't right. work. Really right, well. right, okay. I used to talk to kids and I, I would say, you know, I'm going to explain how to use this. And I'm telling you, every kid's name started with an A. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I realized that's not the way to explain it, but you choose a different letter other than A. Oh, and you okay. start writing your alphabet out underneath, being very careful so things line up. Right. You reach the end of the alphabet, you have to wrap around, 
Sure. And right. start at the beginning. Yeah, so that's... now it's easy. When you're writing your letter, you look at, let's say I want to write the word secret. And I've moved over three letters. So instead of an S, I put down a P because oh, a P is okay. three letters earlier. Right. Okay. Instead of an I e, got gotcha. I put down a B. So it's pretty straightforward for me to write it. And as long as your friend knows that you move three letters in this direction or four letters in that direction, it doesn't right. really matter. Right. You just need to somehow tell your friend which way it is. And here's the big hint. If you don't want Eve, the eavesdropper, <laughs> to figure it out, don't use the same code each time. Oh, right? because I that like is how that. Elizabeth Friedman cracked the Enigma machine. We think of uh, Turing as nope. cracking it, which he did, he and his team. She and her team did also because someone did not change the beginning letter. He got mm. lazy. One of the operators got lazy. So she had enough messages that she could look at them and figure out what was going on. So you That's don't want your Eve, your eavesdropper, to be able to figure it out. You know, I like somehow it. you have to tell, you know, the person, you know, maybe even at the end of the message, you'd, you could say left three. Oh. So the next message is different. And the next message is right five. So I like don't that. Use that same code. Well, this is going to be fun. I hope some of our listeners try this out. Wouldn't this be fun to see some of these answers, Jeff? Absolutely. I would love to see a picture of somebody's coded message. And then who knows, maybe Jennifer and I will give it a try on cracking it. Yeah, wow. that would be really fun. Well, right. this has been fabulous. Thank you so much for being on Solid for Kids, Lori. Thank you, Lori. I've had a great time and I love talking about science stuff. So, <laughs> Well, we <laughs> love people that love talking about science. <laughs> Thanks so much. Okay. I knew I was going to learn some stuff and talk about fun, code breaking, and understanding the connections between codes and computer science. Wow, my mind is churning right now. I know. It's so much fun. And think about all of the fun kids of all ages can have making secret codes with each other. I mean, Jeff, I think we should totally start sending secret codes to each other. What do you think? Oh, absolutely. My next email to you is going to be in code. Uh, good luck trying to figure it out. But <laughs> listeners, you absolutely are going to have a whole lot of fun writing code amongst yourselves with friends, maybe between moms and kids and dads and kids or even moms and dads. This is going to be an episode to come back to again and again. Now, make sure that you guys are doing Lori's Challenge and creating a code of your own. And I would love to see examples of it. Wouldn't you, Jen? Oh, yes, absolutely. So be sure to go to our website, solveforkids.com. You can learn more about Lori and her amazing books, which hopefully should inspire you to do codes because a couple of them are about computer scientists and code breakers. How cool is that? And also, if you want to share with us or leave a comment, or just say, hey, we like this episode, Jen and Jeff, then you can tag us on our social media, which is at KidSolve at Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We would love to hear from you. Absolutely. And if you send that message in code, Jen and I promise we will try <laughs> our best to break it so we know what your message says. <laughs> yes. Until next time, you'll hear us on Solve, Solve It, it for, for Kids. kids.